Hi, I'm Gordon Palmer, and this is another um, edition of Claremont Calling. On Sunday mornings in Claremont, we're going to be looking at the um, Old Testament book, Jonah. It's a very short book, four very short chapters, but wow, there's a whole depth of stuff in it. And, and also, um, it touches on um, a number of issues that are particularly topical for, for our time. And I, I wanted to have the opportunity to maybe... Um, say something about, about these, apart from the, the context of doing so in a, in a worship service. And the, the one I wanted to start with is to do with race. Big issue just now, black lives matter, all lives matter, white lives matter, people are saying, and, and a lot of attention has been given to that. Well, in the story of Jonah, race is an issue as well, because jo one of the reasons that Jonah runs away from God is that God had said to him, as the prophet, to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a foreign city and a foreign country. They were one of the strong, Assyrians were strong, so they were oppressors, and Jonah didn't like the Ninevites. In fact, after he'd um, been brought back by God and sent a second time, and this time he did go and he did share a, share a message um, with them, we have, abs we have the bizarre situation of Jonah being possibly the most successful evangelist in history. He goes and speak, preaches to, to Nineveh, and on the basis of one sermon, the whole city, it seems, hear him and repent. And then Jonah, rather than saying, this is great, what a great evangelist I am, is very angry. And he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending cal calamity, and you've done it for these Ninevites. What a bummer, eh? Racism of the first degree and the first order. And yet, while God had chosen the people of Israel to be his messengers, right from the very beginning, he made it clear he was interested in the whole world. Right from the calling of Abraham, when Abraham was chosen to, to be um, a, a, one through whom people would be blessed, it was the nations of the world who were going to be blessed. In the book of Leviticus, when God's speaking to the people and they're establishing themselves as a, as a nation, he, he says to them, you are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. I am the Lord your God. Because I'm the Lord, because I'm God of everything, same law. And then throughout the Old Testament, there are signs, there are these hints of non-Jews being, being brought into the purposes of God. Rahab the prostitute who helps out the spies at Jericho, or the book of Ruth. And then in the New Testament, the very first page, Matthew chapter 1, Ruth and Rahab, two non-Jews, are, are part of the ancestry of Jesus the Messiah. Jesus himself spending time with, like the woman at the well, a Samaritan, somebody who was supposed to be despised by Jews. You see, God is interested in all people and in all races. And he has said in his word in the New Testament that the church is to be an example of this, an illustration of, of this barriers being, being broken down. And so in the um, book of Galatians, uh, chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then a few pages on in the New Testament, in the, in the book of Colossians, God again says, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, by barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. And that's what the church is called to be and called to do. So where does that take us in these day and age, this day and age with all the stuff that's going on around us? Well, black lives matter. Of course they do. Some people say all lives matter, and, and of course they do. But there is, of course, a particular care and concern that God um, has shown for those who are under the thumb of others. And so even as George Floyd was being murdered in the streets, we could have said all necks are important. But at that point, so was his, and his was being knelt on. 
And somebody could, somebody should have done something. But I think the church has to beware of simply joining in. Black Lives Matter is not just a slogan, but a movement. And there's a lot in the movement that is unhelpful and unhealthy and unwholesome. And so too is the whole business of sloganeering. You see, life is nuanced. Life is difficult in a way that slogans and in a way that statues are not. Somebody scribbles on a statue of, of Churchill. He's, that he's a racist and a misogynist. That's true. And they, might, they might also have added that he's a bit, he was a bit of a drunkard. But he was also a great leader. We're all a mixture of right and wrong, of good and bad. We're all sinners and sinned against. And the slogans, the putting up and the pulling down statues, they don't have the wherewithal to recognize that. It's all either good or all bad, and that's not life. And then the virtue signaling that's going on, that, that's not really it either, is it? What's the point of that? Is it to alleviate the conscience of those who are apologizing for slave traders hundreds of years ago? while at the same time not really giving up the wealth that they have, which no doubt indirectly owes generation back a lot to the slave trade. Repentance is much more than that. The church is called to be different and distinct. That's, that's what I really want to say. The church is called to a new life and a new lifestyle, where, as, as Paul said in Galatians 3 and in Colossians 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free nor rich nor poor. You see, what the church was called to be was an integrated community, a polychrome community of lots of different interests and measures and different strands and status in society. And that's why a lot of the witness of the early church was so spectacular. But at the same time, the early church was having its problems. Right as early as Acts chapter 6, the, the, the church is um, ministering to widows, and that's a good thing. But it seems, so the Greek widows are saying, that they are getting the thin end of the wedge, and the Hebrew widows are getting a better deal. So what does the church do? not slogans, not quotas. They appoint some godly men to work through the situation and, and to change the situation. You see, we're to be with one another and, and to work with one another. And the tragedy of the situation that we have with the race just now and, and with poverty and wealth too, the tragedy is the church forgot what it was supposed to be. As time moved on, the medieval church became the, the rich church, siding with sectors of society against other sectors. And when in the 16th century the Reformation came, and there was a lot that was great about the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, when that came, one of the great things was saying, let's give people the Word of God in their own tongue. Let's give people the, the Bible, not in a Latin language that nobody knows, and let's face it, which it wasn't written in Latin, but let's give it to them in English and German and French. And that was great. But there was a downside. The downside was that churches then became organized around the different cultures and the different languages. And right up to today, and so go into any international city, any big city in the world, and you'll find not just the Church of Jesus Christ, you'll find all these different denominations, and you'll probably find a Polish church, a Korean church, or whatever it is in the different places. And the church, we understand why that's happened, but the church has failed And the church has failed because in Christ we were supposed to work through and work beyond these divisions. And instead we let them settle down. And in settling down, they got a bit worse. 
And so there became black churches and white churches. And there came in, in this country rich churches and poor churches. There were some that were set up specially for the workers' gospel halls that the working class could go to while the rich went to the fancy big cathedrals. We organized that. We did it that way. Isn't that terrible? But let's not just apologize for that. Let's not just do some empty virtue signaling. The church needs to learn to be better than that. The church needs to learn to work through these differences and distinctions. And so the Christian response to living in this world is not to join with the Black Lives Matter movement, which, as I say, has got a lot of unsavory aspects to it. The Christian response is not to take sides in disputes or particularly or to, to support the status quo, although we are to take um, particular interest in those who can't speak up for themselves. But mostly the church is called to model the new community. And of course, there is more opportunity for outstanding examples of that if we live in a, a part of town or a part of a city where there are lots of different races and, and lots of different income levels and so on. But no matter where we find ourselves, we find some differences and some distinctions. And so all of us, we could be asking people in our neighborhood, yeah, but what's it like for you? Have you, you ever found that difficult? Did you ever get laughed at for that? Have you ever been picked on? Is it something to do with your race that makes you different? And, and has that been reinforced to you in unhelpful ways? And are there ways that I communicate that? Why don't you ask people? Because the trouble with the sloganeering stuff is that it's happening from people at either side of the street with a line of polis in the middle, and they don't know each other. They've not engaged. And what becomes the most identifiable things about these people is the either side that the other side that they're on, and the, the shouting and the sloganeering that goes on, and the fighting that goes with it. And sometimes the most identifiable things about the people in the church today is being with their mates being with those who like us. And so, and I admit it's harder to do in times of lockdown, but we won't be in lockdown forever. We need to make effort to say to folks of different interests, different outlooks, different experience, different income levels, different nationalities, different ages, what's it like? How can we understand better? And how can we be a people where we're not just in our wee groups of like-minded, but we're a group of people who, with all the difference and diversity that we have, are saying, yes, but Christ unites. And so even when we're back meeting on a Sunday morning, it's not looking out for the person that you can talk to about Strictly Come Dancing last night or the football results or whatever. It's, all, it's more about affirming our, who we are in Christ and how we're getting on in Christ so that there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor rich nor poor nor male nor female. Because time and time and time and time again, the New Testament says that's what church is. And if we could learn to do that better, to model that better, that would be so much more helpful than signing 150 or 200 petitions. In Christ, let us strive and work for the unity that there is in his kingdom.